Good morning. Much better? <laughs> okay. So my name is Harold Verley. I'm a uh, senior solution consultant uh, at Progress, based out of Europe. Um, been with Progress quite a while. Joined the, um, the Corticon organization in 2007. I was actually part of the acquisition of Corticon back in uh, 2011. So uh, it's been, uh, been a long road with, uh, with Corticon. Very exciting product. Uh, you hear it a lot during the conference. And uh, you also heard from the, uh, the keynote speech this morning um, that innovation has not stopped in Cortico. In fact, it's actually accelerating to, to a large extent, thanks to Jim and his team. Uh, you heard uh, Dimitri and uh, Jim talking about uh, Cortico for JavaScript, which is going to be released um, by the end of this year, which is a fantastic innovation. Uh, but another extremely uh, uh, great uh, innovation is actually the, um, the ability for Corticon to connect to up to, uh, to REST services to pull in data. And that's going to be the topic of the conversation for this morning. Um, so um, prepared a little agenda for you guys. So first of all, I'd like to talk about why is it important that Corticon actually needs to connect to APIs, right? Why do, does Corticon need data to actually you know, make uh, or facilitate decision making uh, uh, in general. Um, we'll also talk about you know the technical implementation. How did we do it? Um, so you've heard a lot of talking about ARC, which is the autonomous REST connector that our folks at the Data Direct site made available uh, in January as a first release. Well, the good news is we built that connector into Corticom. So we're now being able to actually connect through SQL to a REST endpoint. So that's what we will be showing you during this, uh, this presentation. Um, I'll also be showing you ARC, just you know, plain ARC. How, do, how does this work you know, in combination with a REST endpoint and how can we query that data source? Um, and lastly, uh, obviously, I'd, I'd like to finish with uh, you know some roadmap items, some some likely candidates that we're looking at to actually build in, into uh, into Corticon as well. And um, I actually encourage you to come afterwards after the presentation towards me to just to talk about you know what you, what you see what could be could be important that we put in into Corticon uh, as well. Um, so let's just uh, hit it off. Well. I guess you know we've all noticed the rise of, of the API economy, as we call it, right? Uh, more and more, we see that everything is basically positioned as, as a service. So if I want to get around in town nowadays, I'm actually from Amsterdam, right? So if I want to get around in Amsterdam, uh, you know, parking my car is extremely expensive. Um, so it's actually better to actually park my uh, my car outside town. Uh, just shuttle in with the metro or the bus, and then you know take a little step just to get around. Uh, and so the, the only thing you have to do is actually you know uh, register for that particular service. Uh, you got birds and limes, you know, you've got all kinds of names, uh, and walk up with your app to the uh, this, this little uh, little step, and then just just you know. Uh, uh, push a button and, and initiate the rent for uh, you know, a, a very short duration of that particular uh, vehicle. Uh, you know, Uber is another example. I mean, so there, there are so many examples where, where businesses actually you know, uh, uh, allow you to kind of tap in into their products or services via apps. Now, it, that has you know, some very serious implications on the back-end infrastructure. Because, you know, we used to actually do everything kind of in the, uh, on the inside of our company, inside the firewalls of our company. Um, you know, processing sales orders, you know, doing manufacturing, whatever it was, you know, really inside the confines of our firewalls. But now suddenly, because we are st starting to extend you know, our product and services to the outside world, uh, and we expect people to actually consume those, those products and services through apps, we need to actually open up our IT infrastructure as well uh, through APIs. And it's what we call breaking 
breaking uh, apart the monolith, putting all these different, you know, uh, services that we have, like like billing services, you know, uh, how can I book a particular uh, asset, like a taxi, uh, or the management, um, even finance, financial services, etc. So we, we kind of need to expose all of that to the outside world. And so the, 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 what we see happening is that more and more companies are building microservices, and on top they build APIs to actually allow, you know, external parties, certainly with a certain level of security, to tap into those uh, into those services. Sure. Uh, no, go ahead. I, that could certainly be a, an example of a microservice where, uh, you know, still the back end registers uh, those, those orders, those, those bookings. Uh, there is an associated financial transactions uh, with it as well, maybe involving third parties. Uh, all of that can be built into, packaged into services, essentially uh, atomic services uh, that are then exposed in apps and consumed through apps. So would you say the entire thing of, say, Service or each of those would be, no, each of those would be, you know, atomic services that, based on the need at a specific date, date and time, or a particular user, particular service offering, is going to be utilized. Okay. All right. Yep. So we see also this reflected kind of in the growth of public APIs, right? So it's kind of exploding. More and more services, more and more data is becoming available publicly. And this is the public API. So you kind of see the growth. Uh, literally, uh, in 2018, this is, was one of the latest surveys with like something having something like 20,000 public APIs available on the web. Actually, I will be leveraging uh, some of those APIs in my demonstrations today. Um, but this ignores the fact that there are literally hundreds of thousands of internal APIs that companies put available as well that you can access, you know, based on the proper credentials and what have you. Um, so we've seen this really, this, this seen this in, in, uh, explosion of, of, uh, of APIs, uh, REST-based APIs uh, to, to enable, you know, new, new services. And, you know, CTOs actually confirm that in order for, um, uh, their, their companies actually survived and thrive. Um, APIs are absolutely essential. Certainly, integrating APIs into their ecosystem of apps is essential, right? Um, if I rent that little uh, little scooter or step or whatever it might be, I might tap in into you know Google Pay, Apple Pay, or wh whatever the payment uh, service is. It's again, it's an example of an API, a financial API that is leveraged in that app, right? And it's critical that, you know, those services um, are, are exposed publicly uh, to be consumed. So we recognize the fact that Corticon also needs to integrate with, you know, the, those API um, data sources. Now, you know, over the, over the past, I would say, uh, Ten years, Corticom has had uh, you know excellent data connectivity uh, uh, options. Really focused on connecting to internal data sources, right? Uh, relational data sources. So we uh, the, the initial um, uh, capability that we actually built in into Corticom was was EDC, which was the Enterprise Data Connector. It was actually subject of the, the topic uh, of my, my workshop that I did here on, on, uh, on Monday with uh, quite a few folks. Uh, so the Enterprise Data Connector was really focused on augmenting the data of single transactions by looking into a data source, a relational data source, to say, well, you know, I received, for instance, this claim ID what is the what is the, all the other data that go with that claim? Because I need that data. For example, the claim amounts, the type of claim, uh, the damage uh, you know on my car that uh, 
um, the, the, that, that happened. Uh, it's, so all kinds of information that I need to actually process that claim, to adjudicate that claim. That was ADC, right? Single transaction enrichment, as we call it. And then later in, I would say, 2017, we came up with the advanced data callout, really to process large, large volumes of data, uh, again, based on accessing one or multiple uh, data sources um, that usually live internally in the enterprise. Um, so those were great, great, and absolutely stunning capabilities, um, which you know we had certainly we had uh, a lot of success with in in different industries such as healthcare, banking, pharma. Uh, you know we we have examples where we process literally uh, tens of millions of, of claims. I mean the state of Ohio, which was. Um, the episode of care use case that we discussed yesterday in one of our workshops was a typical example of that. Um, so great, but internally focused in many respects. Now, there might be a lot of reasons actually why you cannot connect to a particular data source, uh, right? Uh, you may, uh, and uh, you know, deal with. Uh, with uh, multi-tenant uh, data access, for example, which is uh, complicating things. Um, so if you connect with uh, JDBC directly to a database, uh, well, you get access to the, to the complete set of data, right? So if you're dealing with a multi-tenant database, it's, it's a little, uh, little tricky. Uh, perhaps you wanna you know, put on top of your database some kind of service layer, data access service layer that prevents your users to actually get access to the full data in your database. Uh, you might have regulatory compliance requirements or uh, quality of service concerns. Uh, think about the fact that a user launches a, a query to your database pulling back like 10 millions of records. What does that do to the uptime of that database for other users, right? It has a serious performance impact. Um, the other thing is, you know, you might have an extremely complex technical schema. Building a service with, in Corticom, building rules against that complex schema um, is for business users kind of a daunting task, right? Uh, very difficult. So you want to kind of have an, an abstraction layer on top of your database as well to actually say, well, you know, let's simplify this. Uh, and this is what kind of, you know, the data access we offer to our users, which is simplified and easier to consume. Um, so, and the, and the last thing I would say is sometimes um, the, the, there is no other way to access a database than through a service layer, through an API, because simply IT prevents you from kind of tapping in into the database through ODBC or JDBC, which we used to do with the Enterprise Data Connector and the Advanced Data Connector. So, in conclusion, um, Corticon data integration strategy has been really focused on on-premise relational data sources, and we need now to extend out to either public APIs or internal the APIs to actually address those problems that I just described. Okay, so back in, well, I was actually last year, we were actually looking for a solution. So we came together as a Corticon team and we thought, you know what, how can we enable this, right? How can we, act, how can we enable Corticon to actually access external data? We can build it ourselves, but that's gonna be a, quite a task, right? And then suddenly, you know, what popped up was the, the data direct team that came up with this brilliant idea uh, to put a piece of technology um, in place, which is called the Autonomous REST Connector, uh, allowing you to consume a REST endpoint over SQL. So, brilliant, because you know, Corticon already talks SQL, right? We have the Enterprise Data Connector, we have the Advanced Data Connector, they're all making use of essentially SQL, JDBC SQL. Um, and this connector actually then allows us actually, to, you know, using the same capabilities already present in Corticon to actually tap into that REST endpoint. So we said, let's, uh, let's try that. Let's give it a try. Let's build the ARC, the Enterprise Data, the uh, Autonomous REST Connector into Cortical. 
So just to visualize this, you know, conceptually from an architectural perspective, this is what the autonomous rest connector does, right? It taps in into all these data sources, whether it is big data, uh, SaaS applications, operational databases um, that expose REST APIs, whether those are big data, cloud APIs, or enterprise APIs, right? Internal APIs. And it allow you, using SQL through BI tooling as an example, but just plain query tools will, will do as well, using that driver to connect up to those REST endpoints and consume that data just with plain SQL, which we all know developers are used to, right? Um, so we thought, you know, Corticon would be excellent to actually leverage that capability. And then basically that exposes out all those public APIs to Corticon as well. To pull in data, for example, reference data. So let's imagine the case where you need to pull in, uh, you know, for an exchange rate as an example. Right, to calculate an order amount in a different currency. Let's think about um, uh, a mortgage application where um, a credit bureau is consultant or multiple credit bureaus are consultant for your credit risk. You know, those are all services that you want to leverage in Corticon for decision-making activities. Um, you pull in that data and then the decision engine can make a decision. So ARC has a number of key features. So first of all, it automatically um, maps uh, JSON responses that you get from the REST endpoints to what we call an internal memory uh, database representation, okay? So JSON is fairly complex can be extremely nested, et cetera. So what, what the ARC does, it translates that structure uh, into, into basically a set of tables and fields. Like it, so it looks basically like a database. Like a, a, so a REST endpoint looks like a database, a uh, set of tables with, with relationships between them. Uh, it also does uh, what we call heuristic sampling. So it figures out from the JSON response what data types are, are, are likely to be associated with each field in that, in that JSON. So it will recognize the fact that there are decimals, strings, integers, and so forth in that, in that request, uh, uh, in that uh, response payload. Which is brilliant because, you know, again, you've got many, many data types probably in, in that, uh, in that um, REST uh, response. Um, you know, it also shows uh, here on the slide, you can kind of push the filters that you want to use. You can push them to the, to the REST endpoint. So in other words, your SQL where clauses, you know, plain SQL where clauses, are actually pushed over to the REST endpoint uh, by the driver. Um, so uh, as I said, it just offers a plain SQL support. I'll demo that in a moment. It obviously offers, you know, authentication. Currently, uh, ARC offers uh, these four types of uh, authentication, and I'm pretty sure that the list will be extended in the future as well as part of the roadmap of ARC. Um, so just to be clear, at the moment, we support APIs that have JSON responses, um, uh, and that, that is important. Um, and we'll, we'll come to that when we talk about the roadmap because, again, there are different types of JSON responses as well, but this is one of the most common ones. Um, we support parameterized APIs either through uh, the URL um, or as, uh, as parameters in the request body. So the first one is really you put the, um, the query parameters in the URL that you're firing off to the REST endpoints. And secondly, you put the, the query parameters in the request body, so both modes are supported. So if I understand this correctly, this is, it would let you take two disparate data sources, pull them together, and then you can do thinner SQL, left, inner, outer, cross, fine, right? 
The answer is yes. I see Tony nodding his head. Tony is the, uh, the architect on the ARC products in the back of the room. And that is absolutely true. Do you, do you, yeah, just. Do you, so, but it's just basically, you have these disparate data sources that maybe are in, they could be in SQL, it could be any type of database, and you can just, I just want to make sure I understood that you could do joins through SQL across these data, these databases, because the data comes back as JSON. It makes, makes, I just want to make sure I understood that that was my Absolutely. So, so now, but it's not going to be atomic because it's only read-only, right? It's gonna be read-only for the moment. Let's be clear about that. It's on the slide as well. For the moment, it's read-only. Roadmap, a likely roadmap candidate, is the fact that we will also support write support in the future. For the moment, so writes and updates, right? So uh, so inserts and updates. For the moment, read-only uh, is, is supported. Okay. All right. Um, I have a second question. Yep. So, as you have all these disparate databases in different places, the speed of the network becomes important in certain times. Yes. Like, let's, um, I mean, an example might be that you have, uh, and, and my question is about how to deal with this, uh, when the speed is of the essence. So let's suppose you have um, a set of courses at a college, mm -hmm. right? And let's suppose that Everybody wants, let's say there's a thousand students, and everybody wants this class, right? And so, um, and let's suppose there's a, a single wait list that is available for, say, some of the classes. You know, there's a table of wait lists for these classes. Yep. And students come in, and you have to get disparate data from multiple places. But you end up having to wait on a number of network connections. And let's say there's table locking, right? Because there's only one. <laughs> you complicate things, really. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, Tony, you want to chip in? Because I see you waving your hands. So, you, you kind of. This afternoon, we're doing a double session um, dealing with REST at the enterprise level. It's called the REST of the Story. Um, myself and the product owner for ARC are going to be there. And we're doing this, we're, the whole session isn't just about ARC, but it's about dealing with REST at scale. So if you're interested, it, the reason it's a double session is because it's an interactive session. Now we're going to take these detailed questions. Um, I'm worried that the question might be out of scope for Harold's presentation. Yep. But, thank you. Thank you. But we, can, we, will, we can answer those questions. Also, we're available at the booth uh, during every break. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. Guy. No, no, no. Which is good, really. Thanks for those questions, but absolutely, we'll we'll handle them in uh, your session or at the booth. There was a question in the back as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's continue. Um, yeah. Let's let's take a look at this. Right. I mean. And, and I know you guys are all geared up for the uh, the party tonight, right? So I wanted to get you in the mood, right? So we'll talk a little bit about beer. I know, I, know, I could probably prefer to talk about coffee this morning, but hey, <laughs> let's just start with some, some beer. Uh, now, there, there happens to be a public beer API. Yeah? Probably most people don't know this, but it's really interesting. Um, so, so let's just explore that public REST API to connect to it uh, and just do, uh, do a little bit of a query against that, that data source. So first of all, so this is Postman. Um, this is a, uh, a REST, uh, REST tool, essentially open source. Most people probably know this. Um, uh, it's just... And as you can see here, we have a, uh, an API, uh, Beers. It's an, on an HTTPS endpoint, which, uh, which is uh, pretty open because there's no authorization or whatever. I'm just going to you know, send this to, uh, to this REST endpoint. And you can see there is a, a fairly extensive um, response actually uh, coming back, right? I mean, lo loads of Beers. This is a Berliner Weisse with Jezu, whatever it might be, right? It's a Japanese citrus Berliner uh, 
Weiss beer. Uh, hope you can read it in the back. <laughs> Um, so there are lots of details uh, associated with it, uh, volumes, boil volumes, methods of production, temperatures, fermentation, twist, ingredients, uh, hops, uh, food pairings. So with what beer would you kind of match up this, this kind of um, this beer, right? what kind of food would be, be, be good with this? Uh, brewer tips, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of information, lots of data, different data types as well, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm actually going to use um, a, a little, another little uh, open source database tool uh, to actually launch a query against this REST data source. So um, I hopefully you can see it a little bit in the back. Just, just give me the, a notch if you can't. I, I'll zoom in, right? So what you have here in this tool uh, is you can create aliases against a specific uh, source. Uh, and obviously, you have drivers that you know, connect up to, uh, to those data sources. Um, and you can actually see that we, we also inserted the, uh, the Procris ARC, ARC uh, JDBC driver here. We also have it available for ODBC, by the way. So, but I, I use the, uh, the JDBC connector. And if you look at the details here, you can see um, the, uh, its name. Uh, and basically what you see, I referenced the, uh, the driver's jar, jar, jar file here, the odorest.jar, which is the, um, the first release of, uh, of ARC here um, as a driver. All right, oh. let's go back there. All right, so I created an alias for this particular uh, REST API. Um, so basically, I inserted the uh, the REST uh, API. Now, this uh, this obviously had there is a lot there are a lot of driver properties uh, that you can set for this particular driver. They're all exposed here in the interface. I haven't touched anything. I just you know plain vanilla uh, just threw in the day, the driver and connect uh, to that uh, driver endpoints. So I'll, I'll just uh, connect up to it. And the, the, the rest endpoint that I just uh, just showed. So now here on the left side, you can actually see what is coming back from, uh, from the driver. So this is part of the discovery process. And it actually comes back with uh, a bunch of tables in the uh, other rest schema. Uh, and the tables are, um, again, I'll zoom in. The V2 beers, the uh, mesh temperature, the molds, the hops, the food pairings, all the stuff that you just saw in the, uh, the response JSON, right? So, but now we have them as tables, right? As, uh, and if I just click on V2 beers as an example, you see the colon names, right? That the ARC driver has discovered. Like, so this is all the content, including the data types that have been auto-discovered by ARC. Brilliant, I'm just talking to a database here now. With so let's do a query, right? Let's just do a, um, so I got several beer uh, queries here. Let's just do a select uh, all from, uh, from beers. And this is obviously demo time. Why is that <laughs> not uh, working? Uh, let's do this one. Let's just do a complex query. Right. Uh, select uh, from uh, beers the name as well as the alcohol percentage, uh, and from another table, food pairing, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the food pairing. Obviously, so what 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 food would be be good with this particular um, uh, beer? Uh, and obviously, I have an SQL where clause where I connect basically up both tables. And you can see, I just pull up I pull pull back all the tables. Uh, you can see the different types of beer, their alcohol percentage, as well as the food pairings. So apparently a trashy blonde, 4.1 percent, goes well with fresh crap with lemon. All right? So very interesting information, right? All right. So you can see how easy it actually is to launch an SQL query against a, a REST uh, endpoint. Uh, it's really a matter of, of, of minutes to actually configure this. And this is like really magic. 
Now think about it. We can use this in Corticon to pull in data, to augment the data of, for example, an applicant, a claim, uh, whatever it is. Uh, that would be absolutely fantastic. So. Is Squirrel open source? Squirrel is open source, yeah. It's just a utility. Nothing to do with progress. Okay? All right, so we wanted to, uh, as I said, enable uh, ARC in Cortico. Um, so again, as I said, you know, REST is basically represented as an in-memory database, a relational database. You just saw that in the demo, right? Uh, and it's in Corticon, we actually implemented the reach out to that data as a, what we call a service callout. By the way, you guys get, all get access to the presentations and the recordings, um, maybe not next week, but maybe the, the week afterwards. So don't worry about it. If you, um, if you see some interesting material, you'll get access to it uh, just after the next event, okay? Um, so, the, the, the use of, of, of ARC in Corticon is actually very much the same as, as ADC, right? Uh, it's actually a part of, the, it's gonna be part of, uh, of the rule flow as a, as a component in the rule flow that you configure for REST data access. Uh, it also allows you to tap in multiple REST data sources in one single decision flow. So if you want to reach out for a currency uh, lookup or uh, a credit bureau lookup at the same time, all in the same flow, it's all gonna be possible. You can mix and match. You wanna tap in into your internal data sources at the same time in the same rule flow using SQL. You can use a, the uh, advanced data connector. Um, so you can mix, mix and match. You can make it as complex as you want. Um, the other nice thing is, is because we're talking to an internal relational database representation, we can use the same mapping capabilities that we already have available in Corticon to map to relational data sources. So that's gonna be really easy as well and familiar to you as well because most uh, Corticon users that use or leverage this capability already know about this. All right, so uh, you know, from a REST capability, we allow you to import new entities. So for example, reference data might be a good example. I gave you the example of the currencies and the currency codes and currency conversions. It's usually a limited set of data, like you know, something like 50 or maybe 150 uh, data elements that you wanna pull in into Corticon for decision making. Um, and secondly, you can retrieve data to augment existing entities that you pass in into a request payload. So for example, I wanna apply for a mortgage. I'm an applicant, right? So my name is Harold. I probably live somewhere in a, in a database or whatever. So when the, uh, my, my mortgage needs to be processed, you know, the unique applicant ID, it's my identifier, my, maybe it's my social security number can be passed in into the service. And the service, based on the REST API, will then use my social security number to look up all my details. Okay, so this is what we call retrieve, augmenting uh, the, the data. Um, now obviously we, we support query parameters to actually launch, you know, uh, or, or inform the REST endpoint what data to, to give back. Uh, and there are different ways of passing those parameters. You can pass them as query strings and path parameters. So for the, uh, for the, the folks that understand REST endpoints, this should be, uh, be uh, understandable, okay? Um, so obviously when we run a Corticon decision service, uh, we want to pull data that is relevant, right? So. Um, just gave you the example, if I pass in my social security number, you know, that social security number should be used as a kind of a substitution parameter in, in the query string to pull back my data, right? So we do dynamic parameter substitution as well. Yep. Sorry, that dynamic parameter substitution, that can be a parameter that's been derived by prior 
Absolutely, that's very good. So everything that lives inside intercortical working memory, whether it is determined by the rules, whether it is sub, you know, provided externally in the request payload, as an example, can be used as a substitution parameter. Very good point, okay? So we already talked about discovery. Really, it's the, uh, the process to infer the data types from the request payload. And you see an example here on the right side. We saw it in the demo as well. It's a heuristic process, right? So it's a best guess, so to say. But it's, it's pretty reliable, actually. I'm, I'm really impressed by what the team did there. Uh, but sometimes, really, with very complex schemas, it might not be sufficient. So we also offer you to actually provide what we call a user-supplied schema. So in other words, you can do the discovery in Corticon, right? So the ARC will, will say, oh, this is a decimal, this is a string, and this is kind of the name for that particular field and so forth. You can export that file and you can edit it and re-import it. And we will then add that file to the vocabulary and use it during runtime. So you have a lot of control over this as well, which is a, a huge benefit. All right, so let's let's take a look at this, right? Um, so well, so this is a, another service I uh, I dreamt up. It's again a public API that I'm, we're going to use. We're going to you know uh, I, I'm going to give you some recommendations for some really good movies. Okay, so um, so we're going to connect our, our Corticon vocabulary to uh, IMDb, which is the, um, the uh, internet. Um, uh, movie database, right? It's um, it's publicly available. Uh, we can some import some data and map that to our vocabulary. So we have a match between the REST service and the Corticon fact model, the the the, the, the vocabulary that that drives essentially our rules, right? Uh, we obviously need to configure our rule flow because again we need to do that substitution, right? So if I ask for a specific movie title. I want to pull only the information for that specific movie title, uh, and then basically we, we'll run the service for you. All right, so that's what we're going to do here in this uh, in this demo. So for for those that do not know this uh, this service, IMDb, just uh, just type it in imdb.com. Game of Thrones. I, I love that show. I guess everybody does, right? So that's uh, just one example. Um, but you can see there is a lot of information on the Game of Thrones that is presented very, very nicely here in this, um, on this website. Now, from an API perspective, <laughs> yeah, things look a little different, obviously, uh, as you might uh, imagine. So this is the, uh, the API, right? Uh, it's omdbapi.com. Uh, o -M there is a specific API key which authorizes me to actually pull data. Um, there is a movie title, T title. So these are the kind of you know query parameters, uh, right, uh, that we use to actually pull data, all right, from that REST API. And those, the documentation for those would be on IMDb or be somewhere else? Um, so this is on IMDB, where you kind of register to get access to that particular uh, public API, and it will uh, give you examples of all the kind of query parameters you can use against that REST endpoints. And this is just one example, right? Uh, this is for movie titles. So if I launch this, uh, again, I'm getting a lot of information back for that particular movie. Oh, sorry. All right, so. I'm, I will not be showing everything, but there is a lot of information there, guys. I mean, really. So this is exactly what I just sh showed you on the web page, right? But this is an unformatted, raw JSON. So ugly, ugly. All right? All right. So, um, oops. So we actually want to, you know, kind of see this in, uh, in Corticom. So this is our service, right? So we get movies from IMDb, the yellow brick here in this rule flow, that is actually my REST callouts, right, that I just talked about. Um, and then, you know, the green blocks are essentially my, my rules, right? So if I click on recommend movies, oops. All right, so let's go there. So I'm actually in my rules um, based on 
my vocabulary, which is here on the left side, I'm actually calculating an average movie rating, you know, and then, you know, based on the average movie rating, whether it's under six, between six and eight, and eight and 10, I'm actually showing you a, a number of rule statements that are down here, okay? So nothing complicated, but I'm just calculating an average rating based on what is coming back from the, uh, from the call. Now for that, I need to configure, first of all, my vocabulary. Uh, in my vocabulary, I need to add a data source, a, a REST data source, all right? So you see that that has now been added to, uh, to Corticom. Here on the tab that initiates that, uh, I have, I've defined basically uh, the service. So let me just uh, uh, clear the schema. All right, so now I have access to the REST URI, U, URL. Um, it, the authentication is parameter token. Remember that I needed a token from the service when, when I register, I get a unique token just for me that gives me access to that service. And obviously we support the other uh, authentication methods that were on the slide that I previously discussed with you as well. Uh, you pass in the API key, which is a secret key obviously, and the query parameter T for title. And the title, by default, I just picked a movie title, right? June, whatever, all right? Uh, that allows me to discover the schema, right? And you can see it is automatically uh, added to Corticon, successfully imported. And now I need to map everything uh, to the entities, which is the, the, the movies, but a lot of information, as well as the ratings, as you can see, for that movie. Um, so the movie will map to this particular table, which is the auto rest schema dot rest data. You saw exactly the same in Squirrel. Remember that we had those tables, right? So this is the table selection. And obviously the table has colons like title or runtime or when is it released or what, where can we find information on the website and stuff like that, right? So these are all the colons that are available and map to a particular data type in the Corticon vocabulary. Now lastly, I need to configure the service, right? This little block in the rule flow, it has properties and it allows me to select the appropriate method of import, import or retrieve. Now, I wanna retrieve, I wanna, because I launch a search title and that search title needs to be complemented with the information that comes from IMDB, right? So that's kind of the service, the method I, I'm, I'm initiating. And it has runtime properties as well. It has a data source, obviously my IMDB REST uh, service that I just defined in the vocabulary. It pulls the data and puts it in the movie entity in the vocabulary. And the substitution parameter will be the movie search parameter. Okay, so looking at this from a test sheet, I got three movies here, Pulp Fiction, Showdown for the Redemption and June. And I can just launch that over here, the service will be compiled, takes a couple of seconds, and it will launch a REST call, augment the data, so in other words, complement the data on the entity with the search parameter, and pull all that data from IMDB, including all the ratings for that particular movie that I then used to average up, and for each movie, I then provide a recommendation that you could see down here. All right, so the movie Pulp Fiction, produced in year 94, it's between brackets, so that's kind of coming from the service. And the Pulp Fiction movie is a great movie, you won't regret seeing it, et cetera. So that's, that's the, the, the rules being triggered by the rules, okay? So this gives you an example of how easy it is actually to pull data in, into Corticom for decision-making activities. All right, so let's finish this up. I have a couple of seconds. We, um, we have a roadmap. We anticipate also supporting OData in the future, which is another REST flavor. Currently we support REST 
over JSON. So just be aware of this. OData will be added most probably as well in the very near future. We're working towards that. For example, if you want to tap in into Microsoft Dynamics, the only way to do that is through OData version 4. So we will be supporting that in the future. Uh, dynamic user credentials will also something that will be possible in Corticon. So in other words, if you have a multi tenant database, you want to pass in those credentials externally into you, when you uh, initiate your decision service, right? And those credentials are then being used for the data lookup, right? Whereas today they're static, tomorrow they might very well be dynamic. Um, you saw the vocabulary. It's actually not automatically created off the data source definition. We anticipate that it's something that we can build as well. So actually populate the vocabulary, the Corticon vocabulary for you automatically based on the rest content, but it might, uh, similarly, it might also be a, an internal uh, relational database structure for which we generate, auto-generate the vocabulary. Um, there are some other uh, stuff that we're working on, certainly on the Open Edge side, the JSDO as well, that we want to support, but I delegate that to, to uh, Tony for his uh, afternoon session <laughs> and write support that we already talked about. Okay, so with that, sorry guys, I run, overrun with one minute. Um, just like to point out, there is a next session here as well, uh, just after this section. Uh, so we would welcome you back if, uh, if you're interested, and thank you very much.